All right, now we're into 2.5, and what's going to happen in 2.5 is they're going to remind us about an intermediate algebra principle of shifting. And so let's take a function like f of x is equal to the square root of x, something that we know, right? But something that we may not be super familiar with, but we know from the last section. We know it looks like this. Do you remember what happens if I take a function like the square root of x and add a number like 3 after the fact, like there's the square root of x and then plus 3. What does this plus 3 do? Well, what it does is it takes all the previous y values and shifts them up 3. So rather than starting at 0, 0, my entire function is moving up 3 units. That, um, it, that 3 level is the same as the 0 level above, so any number added after the thing will move it either up if it's positive or down if it's negative. It's a direct thing. So if we had something like f of x is equal to x squared minus 4. Well, what is that? That's our regular x squared graph shifted down 4 units. Okay, so hopefully you're okay with what I mean by after the fact. Here's the main parent function, and we're shifting down 4 units. Here's our main parent function, square root of x. We're shifting up three units. So step number one is to realize that anything added outside of the function is a direct translation in the y level. If we take our regular f of x function equaling the square root of x, which we know looks like this, what then happens if I take and apply that three inside? the function. So I'm trying to grab the same plus 3, but this time I'm putting it in there. Which way are we going to move? Well, we can find out very easily by plugging in points. This is going to shift us left and right. And so the big question is, and how I think about this when it happens inside is, what number gives me the same starting point? So for example, the starting point right here is when x is equal to 0. What's going to give me that same 0 under the square root in this setting? Notice that it's when x is equal to negative 3. So what's happening is we get the exact same shape. That's what you should get out of the whole discussion from Algebra 2, that the shifting that takes place keeps the same shape. It just moves us somewhere, and it's going to move us back 3 units. Now, why back 3 units? Because it's negative 3 that gives us the same 0 starting point and goes up. If you plug negative 3 in, that's going to give you the square root of 0, which is your lowest point. Notice you can't plug in anything below negative 3. It would be undefined. And so um, when you have the addition happening inside the function itself, it has like the opposite effect, some students will say. What if I had the function g of x is equal to x minus 4, the quantity squared? What's that going to do to my parabola? Well, no problem. What gives you the same zero value out? 4 does. So it's going to shift us 4 units to the right. And we'll have the exact same parabola that we would have had centered at 0, 0. And so this whole section is designed to give us exposure to shifting things uh, left and right and up and down. So what would this type of thing look like? So let's have this as an example. Those are all examples, but I'll call this example number one. Graph y equals, or they might not even use y. Let me go to what they will probably use. They'll probably use, and it's actually good for you to be exposed more to that. They'll probably use f of x is equal to x minus 3 squared plus 4. Well, let's talk about it. What does the minus 3 do that's inside? Well, that's going to adjust us in the x direction. Do you remember if we go left 3 or right 3? Well, the answer is, well, what makes you 0? And because it's 0 that was our um, vertex point, well, 3 makes us 0. We're moving right 3. And what's the 4 do? Up 4. So you're moving right 3, up 4, and that's your new vertex of a graph you already knew. 
because you went through 2, 3, but most likely because you went through intermediate algebra. You have an upwards opening parabola. Awesome, right? Easily applied. They're going to focus on just shifting left and right and all of that stuff. How about this? What would this look like? What would a negative look like that's on the x squared but on the outside? First of all, there is no shifting, so it's going through 0, 0. But now every value is negative. And so what it does is it, what they'll say, is it reflects about the y-axis. So if they ever want you to reflect about the y-axis, you want to put the negative out in front. Okay, that's what's going to reflect you about the y-axis or turn you the opposite direction, right? And that would work for anything. It doesn't have to be an x squared. So if you had f of x is equal to negative x cubed, no problem. What's that going to do to our regular x cubed graph? Well, remember what our regular x cubed graph, I'll draw it up here really quickly, looks like that. Well, it's going to take what was positive and make it negative and what was negative and make it positive. And that's a reflection about the x-axis as well. I'm sorry, about the y-axis as well. It could be the perspective there. So a negative any time on the outside will flip you that way. Um, so, yeah, it will work out really, really well. Um, what about f of x is equal to the square root of negative x? What's that going to do to us? What if I put the negative on the inside of the function, and this is the best place to do it? Well, that's going to flip us about something, right? Now, remember, what's the domain of this guy? The domain of the square root of x, right? Let's go back to the parent function. It was 0 to infinity. Well, if it's a negative x, if you're applying a negative first, you can't plug in any of these positive values. So essentially what's happening is it's going this way now. Right? We're being able to plug in negative values because we're going to immediately take the negative sign of it to get a positive underneath. And so what did it do? It reflected about the y-axis. or the Yeah, the y-axis. So I might have mislabeled that up here. This is reflection about the x-axis. Apologize. Reflection about the x-axis is what's happening there. Reflection about the y-axis is when you have the negative on the inside. Sorry, you saw it flipping over the x-axis, and I apologize for not saying that in the future, but probably not worth restarting the video for. Um, we're human, right? We can handle that. So a negative on the inside will reflect it. You really don't see a lot of functions where there's the negative on the inside, and oftentimes that's because if I did that to something like f of x equals negative x squared, well, what's negative x squared simplify to be? It just simplifies to be x squared. Now, let's look why. That makes sense. It wouldn't make it any difference to put a negative in there because it's already symmetric about the y-axis. So flipping it about the y-axis, it would look exactly the same, and that's what the algebra is telling us. Hey, there's no difference in that function. So it's kind of cool because it can give us some, some insight into things that we already know. So they're going to ask you at some point to maybe look at a function. So they'll give you something like this. They'll have a graph, and they'll go down two units, and they'll have a V-shape. And they'll say, write the equation of that. And here's what we hope you do. We hope you say, oh, this is f of x. The parent function is the absolute value, and I'm being shifted down two units. So that's a minus 2 on the outside. If I saw it like this, right, it's coming down to that level. Oh, they're not trying to trick you. It's going to be one of the parent functions. Oh, that's the absolute value graph, but it's being shifted to the right 2. Okay, shifted to the right 2 means it's happening inside. And right 2, I'd have to, in order to get that 2 out, I'd have to go a minus 2 on the inside. So they'll work it both backwards and forwards where you're looking at a graph coming up with it or where you're looking at an equation and coming up with the graph. Um, they'll have a function like this 
y is equal to, they love the square root of x, and they'll say, hey, shift it up four units. Um, move right two units and reflect in y axis. And so what do we want you to do? We want you to realize, oh, okay, if I'm going to um, actually, let's reflect in the x-axis. You'll see, well, I, I need to make that change um, for right now. So we'll, we'll go through there. Shift up four units is four being after, added after the fact. Move right two. Hopefully you know that's a minus two under there. And then reflection in the x-axis would always be a minus on the outside, right? X-axis gets your y's meet being turned upside down, and so it's a negative on the outside. Done. That will do it, right? And you'll just type that in and be done. Now, here's what they're going to do. They're going to give you at the very end, they're going to make sure that your algebra skills are good still. They're going to tell you, hey, f of x is a parabola. And the parabola is x squared minus 4x plus 3. And they would like you to find out how it shifted by writing it in a very specific form. right? So the form would be f of x is equal to x minus a squared plus b or something like that. You need to get a perfect square in there so you can see the shifting. So they're reminding you about something you learned at the end of Algebra 1 and utilized a lot in Algebra 2 and that is completing the square. So I don't know if you remember completing the square but we will need you to. It is a very very common tool. So what you do in completing the square is you isolate the x's. You're hoping to create a perfect square trinomial. So you take half of the middle term, half of the four and you're going to square it. So half of 4 is 2 squared is 4, so you're going to add 4 here. Now if you add 4 to that side, you got to subtract 4 from the outside. right? We're not going to want to go over and mess with the left-hand side. If we're going to add 4 and subtract 4. So notice if I drop the parentheses and brought the red numbers that I added together, I would still have the exact same thing. So we're reminding you about the completing the square process. I can open up any of your Algebra 2 books and be able to find it. It was definitely something that we needed you to remember. Um, so what is this? Why do we do all this? This is x minus 2 squared and 3 minus 4 is negative 1. So now you know all about this. Oh my goodness, I know about this. This is a parabola that's being shifted 2 to the right and 1 down to get started. And it's opening up just like this. Okay, The factoring, you might have thought, well, I can just factor. Well, if you factor, it's not going to help you identify the shifting, per se. I think you could argue that it could. We know how this factors. This is x plus 3. Um, sorry. x minus 3. x minus 1. And so notice that we're again agreement. The zeros are three and one. So here's the here's the one and here's the three, right? That it would have been there. Suppose you could have used that to figure out that the vertex is at two, and then plug the two in to see that it was at, at negative one. But this is a much more common way to do it, and we need you to be proficient in completing the squares for a variety of other reasons. If your Algebra 2 instructor did not stress the importance of completing the square beyond just calculating, you know, um, I'm sorry, solving a quadratic, they did you a little bit of disservice, but most likely they were teaching to a class who not everybody was going on to, to the in math science engineering route like you are. Okay, they know you're awesome. So let's talk about completing the square. So if we go back and review completing the square, there are some requirements. There must be a 1 on the x squared. There was in our case, right? There cannot be like a 3x squared or a 4x squared. If there is, we've got to fix that. and We'll see that in a minute. Number 2, you isolate the x terms. 
Okay, and so what do we do? We got the x squared and the 4x together, and we booted out the 3 because we don't care about that. That's what we mean by isolating. Number 3, you add half the middle coefficient squared. So you take half that negative 4. I'll call it negative 4 this time in case that bothered you. I usually just take the number because if you square something, it doesn't matter. That's negative 2 squared, which is 4. And that's what you're going to add on the inside, right? So if I come in here and in red, I'm going to add 4. But if I've added 4, I've got to be balanced on that side, so I've got to subtract 4. Right? If you're on the same side, you got to subtract. You're used to balancing most likely by adding things to opposite sides of the equation. Uh, we don't want to mess with that f of x side, and so we just do that. And then we solve, right? Then the, what we created is a perfect square trinomial. So please keep in mind that, that they know that you are math, science, engineering students. They absolutely know that you separated yourself from the... Uh, intermediate algebra students that could have just been doing that so that they could go take a stats class or something like that and never touch math again. So this is the, and that, the last example I want to do, but I want you to be aware that you can do big things. So, and we need you to. So I'll call this example number four. I don't know if it is or not, but close enough. Okay. They want you to do the same thing with f of x is equal to 3x squared minus 42x plus 151. And they're going to force you to do it by making sure you write it in that um, form in which you can identify, I think they call it standard form, in which you can identify the shifting. So remember our criteria. I'm going to come up here. There must be a 1 on the x squared, and there's not. So what do we do when there's not? we got to factor it out. And then if I take 42, i got to divide that by 3. And 42 divided by 3 is 14. Now, I would leave out the 151. So I'm going to put the 151. Remember, we isolate our x's. So we're going to, we're going to put our x terms together, realize there's a 3 with the x squared, and factor it out. Now you're going to ask yourself what half of 14 is. What's half of 14? What's 7? What's 7 squared? Well, it's... I'll add it in blue this time. It's 49. Now why do we do that? Because now we have x minus 7 squared. And we got this 3 that's coming along for the boot. But that's why we did it, because we could create a perfect square. Now, if we add 49 in blue up top, what do we have to subtract on the outside? Well, not 49. We need to subtract. Remember, the 3 is going to distribute to everybody. So we need to, dis to subtract whatever 3 times 49 is. And we need to subtract 147. That's why the 151 was so big. Right? You might have thought, well, that's mean. It's all going to balance out. So where did the 147 come from? It's 3 times 49. Now why the 3 times 49? Because you didn't really add 49 to that side. You added 3 times 49 because it's inside a parenthesis. If you were to combine everything, you would have to distribute the 3 and then combine like terms. And so we really put a 147 on there. 147 and 151 have a difference of 4 with the 141 being higher. Awesome. You can graph this guy now. What does it look like? And I don't even know if they're asking you to graph it, but if they did, we, we know where it is. It shifted seven units to the right. It is shifted, whoops, apologize. I didn't, should not have put a dot there. Seven units to the right, four up still opening up and what the 3 does the 3 makes it more narrow 
right? So you just draw it more narrow than that. It, um, it's a vertical stretch is what our book calls it, which is a really good terminology there. My point in showing you these last two examples is you, we need to be proficient at uh, completing the square. And they don't have a section to teach it to us because, again, the mindset is you learn this twice as you went through, or exposed to it twice, as you went through beginning algebra at the very end and intermediate algebra somewhere in the middle when you were solving quadratics. And then ideally used it to to do work just like this in your intermediate algebra class. If you took me for Math 120, then we definitely did it, right? And it's in the curriculum outline. So we're just rehashing those old skills because they're necessary skills. So, um, so check out this, uh, you know, check out the homework that's related to this. And hopefully this video really helps. If you find that you need extra help in that regard, always reach out. Okay, good luck in everything.